Coming to you live from the fabulous Mediaplex in downtown Windsor, this is a St. Clair College journalism presentation. Hi, I'm Majeka Gorzalnik, and you're watching Mediaplex News Now. In our top story, the corner of Pitt and Ferry Street has been home to Windsor's only daily newspaper for 85 years, but now the building has a new owner. Alice Hewitt tells us more. The crowd grew loud as Windsor Star Editor-in-Chief Marty Benito passed the keys from the paper's former home to University of Windsor President Alan Wildman this past Friday. The building on the corner of Pitt and Ferry will be redesigned as the University's School of Social Work while still maintaining its old facade. This is part of an initiative to bring more students into the downtown core. Damian Boyko said he hadn't heard about the event till he happened to walk by. I uh, never knew about it, walked by and... Excited to come down here and see what's, what's going on, and I think it's pretty cool. A variety of entertainers were on hand, including a live band, the Stilt Guys, and the Lancer mascot. Tim Hortons donated coffee to the event, and a bus was on hand to ferry participants to and from the university. Traffic branch sergeant Michael Fontaine said this is a historic event and one that is good for the community. Uh, a lot of years of history with this building, uh, with it, uh, the, the handing the keys over to the University of Windsor is. Uh, it's good for the community, it's, uh, it's great for the city. QP were also present at the event. Representative Tom Dean said they were concerned with the work that's going to be involved in these buildings as they would be on the regular campus. Uh, basically, we just want a presence here. Uh, we were told that basically we're all, all part of the uh, university family and they wanted us all down. And right now, at this point in the game, when they're contracting our jobs out, we don't feel like a whole lot of members of the family and we just wanted a presence. Similar events like this one will happen in the new year as the University of Windsor takes possession of the downtown armories and old bus depot. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Alice Hewitt. Today has been particularly gloomy. Let's check with Ariana Gendron to see what it's like out there right now. Ariana? Thanks Majeka. Out here it's a little cloudy, a little damp and about one degree Celsius. Tonight the cloud should clear up and it should drop down to a low of about negative three. Back to you, Majeka. The Windsor Police Service will be implementing a 45-day plan of transformation. In this edition of 5 Minutes With, James Zimmerman had a chance to sit down with Police Chief Al Frederick to learn more. Hi, I'm James Zimmerman, and today we're spending 5 minutes with Windsor Police Chief Al Frederick. Uh, so Chief Frederick, uh, what are some of your short-term goals as Police Chief? Good question, James. Uh, well, one of the short-term goals I have has been mandated by the board, mm -hmm. which governs uh, my actions, and they want me to produce a 45-day plan of transformation for the Windsor Police Service, okay. and I'm in the uh, process of doing that today. Okay. Uh, can you give us any uh, details for that 45-day plan? Well, there's going to be, it's going to, there's a few pillars, I would say. Okay. So one of them is going to be extensive leadership training throughout the organization. So we're going to train the very be in a, the best manner we know how. Okay. We're going to bring in very innovative trainers from across the province to do that for us. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at uh, a lot of policy changes. So those are c two of the main, main pillars. Okay. We're, going to we're in the process of recruiting, so we want to get the best people in the door. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to develop our frontline supervisors. So that's going to be the overall plan. Okay, and uh, where do we go after the 45-day plan? So what are some of your uh, long-term goals? Yeah, so long-term, I'd like to embark on a new business, strategic business planning process for the service. Okay. Uh, there's about 31 projects that we've already identified, strategic projects over the one, two, and three-year terms. Okay. So we're going to be busy. Awesome, awesome. Uh, now, during the press conference, uh, when you were officially named uh, Chief of Police, uh, you had mentioned changing the culture of Windsor Police Service. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain what that culture means and uh, just exactly how you plan to change it? Sure. So, in policing, like most professions, you, you're in a constant change, uh, constant uh, mode of change, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not afraid of that, and we've been uh, no strangers to that in the policing profession. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when there's a decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in regards to search, for example, that means we change everything we do in regards to how we search persons or property. Okay. 
We also have legislative changes. We have di differences in our uh, use of force options. Mm -hmm. When I started 28 years ago, we didn't carry pepper spray, we didn't carry tasers, we didn't carry batons. Today we do. So those are all cultural changes, right. and that's the type of thing we're talking about. Okay, very good. Uh, now, after a six-year hiatus, uh, you decided to bring back the Neighborhood Watch program. Uh, why did it fall off the table in the first place? Well, it's, it's a matter of uh, interest. It's a matter of uh, finding value and measuring the success of a program. So okay. one thing that we're very interested in with, at the Windsor Police Service is measuring our successes because a program is no good just for the sake of the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a tremendous interest in our community for that program mm -hmm. and we're going to measure its successes and we're gonna provide the support necessary for all of those people to uh, succeed. Okay, so why was it so important to bring it back then? It was so important because it is effective okay. and the community wanted it and so do, and it's uh, it congruent with what our uh, goals are for community-based policing. Okay, very good. Uh, now, what has the chemistry been like between yourself, uh, Deputy Police Chief Power, and a Deputy Police Chief uh, Duris? That's a great question. Uh, James, we have great chemistry mm -hmm. and it's not just with us but our whole senior leadership okay. and with the entire organization. We're really coming together as a team. Mm -hmm. We're coming together uh, very quickly, and we're um, and we're uh, getting some great results very early on. Good. So uh, we, I've known Rick Darris for 28 years, mm -hmm. and of course I've worked closely with Vince Power over the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of history there, and uh, and yet we all bring different talents to the table. Good. Uh, so actually, speaking to that, uh, how do they fit into your action plan uh, for the future? Yeah. So Vince Power is uh, Deputy Chief Power is very strong operationally. His okay. whole career has been spent in investigation services and patrol and tactical. Okay. He understands policing and all of the operations of the Windsor Police Services better than anyone. Rick Darris, on the other hand, comes from the OPP with a very similar experience, but yet from a different organization. Mm -hmm. So he fits in, bringing those different experiences to the table and allowing us to, to uh, work together as a team to get the very best solution for our community. Very good, very good. Uh, now, they also applied for the police chief position. Uh, so was there a little jealousy when you were announced as top cop? Mm -hmm. um, no, and I don't. I don't believe uh, Vince did, okay. and uh, and Deputy Chief Darris did. But uh, he he wanted. Uh, you know, he was of retirement age, I suppose, mm -hmm. and he wanted a, a a different challenge. And I don't think it was so important to him to be chief or deputy. He just wanted to belong to a team and affect ch change and uh, help out. And gotcha. he he's got that opportunity. Very good, very good. Uh, now, recently, you took the switch to Twitter uh, to show Windsorites a day in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so in what other ways uh, does the Windsor Police Service uh, plan to use social media uh, to reach out to the community? Right, so we're planning to leverage it as best we can in mm -hmm. every facet of the organization. So right now what we're doing is uh, it's real time as we all are aware. Mm -hmm. So it's allowing us to get our message out real quickly. So we're not having to rely on traditional media outlets to uh, tell our story, tell it in the manner which we'd like to tell it, mm -hmm. and get it out immediately. So that's one of the main uh, bonuses of it. Okay, uh, just one final question. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier this month uh, that you were in support of B Bill uh, C-30, yes. the Protecting Children from Internet Predators Act. Yes. Uh, now, this bill does raise some concerns with the four minority governments. Uh, sorry, four mi minority government parties, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of those concerns? Well, they're thinking that it's a, a, a tool for us to snoop on people's uh, internet usage and that sort of thing. It definitely is not that. It is a tool to assist us in investigating people who are abusing children. Okay. So I don't think there should be that fear that's out there okay. as long as we maintain what it's meant to do. Very good, very good. Well, thank you for coming in today. Thank you, James. Uh, I'm James Zimmerman, and we've just spent five minutes with Windsor Police Chief Al Frederick. There, there are many options for holidays fashions this season. Jill Thompson hit the streets of downtown Windsor to see what's out there. With less than a month left before Christmas, we visit downtown Windsor to check out a few retail stores and find out what exactly to buy for the holidays. Sarah DeLuca, owner of Full Circle, which is Windsor's newest downtown retail edition, talks about where she'll be shopping for her holiday gifts, specifically where she'll shop downtown. Well, basically, I would shop at Lou Miles because it's an exclusive men's store, and my husband loves his suits, and um, Enzo's been a friend of mine forever. He's been here for over 30 years. BB Branded is also another option for downtown shopping. 
There are men's urban boutique which carries exclusive labels you can't find anywhere else in Windsor. Here's what owner Ayad El Sadi had to say about what they have in store for the holiday season. And we also have markdowns, period. So the whole store, 80% of shoes pretty much are just marked down uh, 20 to 50% off depending on the item. Christina Stojic works at the Snooty Rooster Tea Room. She lets us know what she'd like to see downtown. Small boutique shops um, where you can buy special gifts. Somewhere like antiques and stuff like that. Yeah, something like that. Check out Awesome if you have a special holiday event to attend. This is a hidden little gem is sure to add much bling to your holiday season. So make sure you all get a jump on your holiday fashions and don't forget about the good stores downtown. I'm Jill Thompson for Mediaplex News Now. It's time to head back to the streets and Ariana will tell us what to expect for the rest of the week. Thanks Majeka. Since it's around dinner time, did you know that our country consumes more macaroni and cheese than any other nation? With that being said, let's look at our three-day forecast. Wednesday will be sunny with a high of 3 and a low of negative 2 degrees Celsius. Thursday will be partly cloudy with a high of 5 and a low of negative 1. We'll stay out of the negatives for Friday with a high of 7 and a low of 3. If you're looking for something fun to do with the whole family, why not join us for a St. Clair Christmas? This stage show runs from December 12th through the 15th at the Chrysler Theatre. The show features the music, theatre and entertainment technology students. This is Ariana signing off at the corner of Victorian University. Back to the studio with Majeka. We are pleased to announce a new segment to our show. We're calling it Ted Farron on Food. On today's first of three parts, we're going to talk about the festive decorating, mainly because this is a time of year that many that many are having dinner parties. Mel Melissa Iaruso is our host. Hi, I'm Melissa Iaruso and welcome to Ted Farron on Food. Today's topic is festive decorating. As many of you may know, Ted owns Ted Farron's Gourmet Butcher Shop at the intersection of Cabana and Dougal on, uh, in Windsor. Uh, so Ted, where do we start? Well, what I like to do is make sure that when my f guests come in the room, they see a festive setting. And that's what I wanted Diane to do today. And Diane's with us from Diane Di uh, Designs by Diane, and so I'm going to turn it over to you girls and show us how we do it, how it's done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so Diane, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? I am an event designer. What I do is create dreams. I can create small dinner parties, weddings, corporate events, just about anything that you'd like me to create. I can basically do it. What I like to do is take the individual, customize the event to whatever they like to see and then we go from there. Okay, so can you tell us what we have here today? Today we have a fairly simple setting and it is uh, it is a bit festive. We can add to it. You could have a little floral design, whatever you like to, whatever you like to add. Um, but we have to remember if we don't have a buffet setting, there has to be a number of plates that are going to be on this table so we have to have the room. Right. So what I usually like to do is keep the centerpiece interesting but keep it up high out of the guests. For view. conversations yes, so they can absolutely, see each other. Absolutely. Yeah, that's and that's and as far as place settings, you know, you can have a number of different things. This one here we have charger plates which come in every color, uh, depending on the event. You don't necessarily have to have them. It's just something we add. You know, yeah. sometimes they can adds a nice touch. Some, you know, some people call them annoying. Some people love them. So you know, whatever you like to do. As far as your napkins, you can do something with a little fancy, you know, napkin holder. You can also do something just like a, you know, a plain, flat fold under the under your plate. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. It's mm -hmm. nice when your guests sit down. It's right there for them. Or you can just kind of basically do something in the glass. So it kind of looks like little flowers around the table okay. as well. Beautiful. Yeah. So um, is there a certain uh, way to set up your cutlery and the plates and everything? Or? Yes, and we have it right here. You know, you have your knives on the right, your forks on the left. You have your dinnerware at the top of the plate. Um, yeah, the, your wine glasses, your water glasses. And that's basically For desserts, your coffee. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, when people are starting to plan a dinner party, where do they begin? Where I like to begin is, first of all, what is the dinner party consist of? Okay. What occasion okay. Uh, are we working with? Then we work with colors. 
whatever colors you choose. It doesn't, we have such a variety of colors now. We don't have to stay to the same basic. Right. You can have something subtle, something elegant, something exciting, whatever you, you choose. Mm -hmm. So again, we start with, you know, you can have the chair covers if you like, but not necessary. If you're doing it in your home, you can have your regular chairs do something interesting. What we have here is an overlay. Again, not necessary. It's just an addition. It brings a little bit more interest. Right. But you can have just a plain, simple floor length tablecloth mm -hmm. to give, you know, bring some elegance in. And that's, um, that's where we basically start. Then we just build. I like to keep it simple. Um, it keeps the cost down and we just want to wow them but with simplicity right as opposed to more things so what's the most important part on the table do you think i think it's the center the food okay. <laughs> no, the, the centerpiece i okay. find and i usually go quite high today mm -hmm. i went with something a little lower this one here is is a little bit isn't something i use that often i usually i would use that on a buffet table where there's no intrusion you right know, so the guests aren't kind of looking all around i usually like to go up high um, I like to go very high. Right. Yeah, I just love the look of, you know, whether it's a, a tree setting or a huge floral or just a simple vase, okay. depending on your budget. You know, you can do something very interesting, right. you know, with a simple vase with bulbs or one single flower, but go up high. Do something exaggerated and extreme. Okay, and you were talking a little bit earlier about details. Can you kind of expand on that? It's all about details, I find. Less is more, no matter okay. what it is, whether it's set design, interior design or decorating, less is more. Remember, we want people to remember the setting. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to go saying, oh, there was so much, you know, I didn't even see what was going on. So keep, you know, like I said, keep, keep your linens very fresh, very clean, very pressed, everything nice and simple. Have your, your centerpiece as your focal point. And again, if you want to do a little candlescape or floral design, you can do that as well. But I, I like to keep it simple. Again, with the right choice of colors and combinations, textures, mm -hmm. You're right on. Okay. Right on so in movies and magazines, we see these uh, extra extravagant setups with all the food on the table, all these decorations. But in reality, that's not always the case that you can even fit everybody at your table on your elbow to elbow. So do you have any tips on that? Absolutely. What we see in the magazine is marketing. Okay. It's not practical. It's very uncomfortable, but it looks great, you know. But what we can do from these magazine ads is pick certain pieces that we like. We love that centerpiece, we love that candlescape, we love that linen. So it's there for us to choose from, almost like a shopping list. Mm -hmm. So you just pick and choose what you like. But to have all this, very uncomfortable for your guest. Mm -hmm. Again, if you want to put more here on the table, then I would definitely consider going with the buffet. So never compromise your decorations, always move the food to a separate table, is that what you're saying? Well, if you're going to do, I would, the food is, again, the most important. Your guests will always talk about the food first and the decoration second. You know, when you walk into a room, you want to have the wow factor, but after you sit down again, you want a nice presentation, simple, but nice. And, and functional. And functional. Right. But like I said, we want to be comfortable with the food. Okay. So this is what we do. So um, a lot of people may think too that it's really expensive to have all these decorations and details and something. Can you talk a little bit about the cost? It can be expensive if, if you, depending on what you want to do. I find fresh florals, absorb a lot of the cost. When I do huge galas and events, I try to do something a lot more interesting here on the table. And we have so many things, again, like I said, different linens, different textures, different vases, different pieces that we can create an illusion without mm -hmm. the cost. Um, as far as, uh, again, tablecloths and all, it, it can be expensive, but then with the right color choice, you can do something inexpensive that would really pop if you're doing a birthday party, for instance, or you're doing just a small event with color. So if you're having a smaller event, color is really important. Yeah. Have it exciting. So you know, no mixing it, and matching. No mixing and matching. No. <laughs> Keep it consistent. Okay. You know, and what they say in design is usually too, if you're trying to create something, you know, more so than just the one table, if you're having an event, is to focus on how you'd like to see one table look and just concentrate on that one table and then expand on that. Mm -hmm. So everything stays consistent. You don't want a bunch of things all over the place like you ran out of something. It's less is more. Okay. So if you don't have it, keep it very minimal. So what's the most um, challenging experience you've ever faced when decorating? I find theme parties are challenging because we definitely want to keep them elegant and exciting, but we don't want to 
overdo it, mm -hmm. you know, so with the budget. So we want, again, with the proper linens and the proper pieces we place here and there. So theme parties to create elegance and fun are very challenging, but I love challenges. So, in, um, so that is what I find that is quite challenging. And what's your favorite event to set up for? I think, um, I, I do, again, even though they're challenging, as I said, theme parties I love because it's the creativity. Um, that you can come up with things that are just like right off the wall if you have to. And I also like to do weddings. Uh, at one time everything was, uh, you know, the same, the same colors, but now I find the brides are becoming, having things that are more exciting and they're crossing their comfort, you know, that comfort zone where I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to do there. But, um, I, you know, to be honest, I love them all. I love just taking, you know, whatever someone has in mind and expanding on that. Okay, so if uh, people want more information about your business, uh, where should they go? Where should they, they visit? They can contact me on my website at www.designsbydiane.org. Okay, so thank you so much, Diane, for coming in today. Thank you, I'm Melissa. I'm Melissa Iruso, and uh, you've been watching our segment on uh, festive decorating. University volleyball season is underway and the Lancers played host to their rivals, the Western Mustangs, November 28th. The Lancers women's volleyball team suffered defeat at the hands of the Western Mustangs on November 28th's rivalry night. The Lancers put up a good fight against their rivals but ultimately lost 3-2 in the five-set matchup at the St. Dennis Center. Outside Kayla Segan led the Lancers with a game-high 19 kills and 20.5 points with middle Brianna Balzer adding 11 kills and outside Chelsea Droulard making a game-high 21 digs. Mustangs right side Stephanie Kruder led her team with 18 kills and 20 points. As a result of their loss, the Lancers have fallen into a tie for last place in the OUA standings, with the Mustangs moving into fifth place on account of their win. The next women's volleyball game at the St. Dennis Center is January 19th, where the Lancers will face off against the RMC Paladins. Reporting for MediaPlex News Now, I'm Adam D'Andrea. In this week's edition of Sports Talk, Kenton Wolf speaks to Windsor Spitfire for forward Ty Belke about growing up playing hockey and his OHL team. How are you, sports fans? Welcome to another edition of MediaPlex Sports Talk. I'm Kenton Wolf. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. Replacing Rob Benny on the panel is Ty Bilkey. Ty, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. So uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, you growing up in Exeter, Ontario. Uh, talk about minor hockey a little bit. Um, well, growing up in Exeter is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it was always fun uh, playing in Exeter. Uh, got to play with a lot of good, good friends. Everybody's really close. So um, I played, uh, it was actually called South Huron Minor Hockey. It was where we, where we played. And, and uh, we, we had a, a pretty good team going up all through. And um, I just, there's a lot of good memories that came from Exeter and, and uh, a lot of great people that, that I still keep in touch with about how my hockey's going now and, and even like coaches and, and things like that. So um, Exeter was, really, was a really good, good time and, and place for me and, and I'll always call it home. Have you always been uh, one of the bigger guys on your team? Uh, yeah, definitely. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always been one of the, one of the bigger, more uh, physical players, and and uh, that's just the role I took on early, and and uh, I got no problem with it. But uh, no, I, my family, everybody in my family is a bigger, bigger person, and, um, straight from my brothers to me, and and I'm actually starting to catch up to them a little bit. But uh, yeah, so I've always been one of the bigger kids. Yet, yeah. uh, you're one of those guys who likes to stick up for your teammates. Why do you think that's so important? Um, I mean, for sure, we don't want guys coming in here and, and uh, pushing us around a little bit. And um, it's important for everybody to look after each other because we're, we're, none of us live at home, right, other than, you know, the, the hometown guys at Kirby. But um, we're, we're a family here and we're away from our families and, and we're all just a big group of brothers. And it's kind of weird if you think about it. Maybe the coaches are our dads. But, uh, no, um, we're, we're a big family and, and you stick up for one another and, and don't let teams uh, push us around or anything like that. So um, that's the importance of, of sticking up and looking after each other. And uh, you said earlier this year you think the Spits are the toughest team in the league. Why is that? Um, just the grit on this team. If you go into that locker room, there is there is not one guy sitting beside another guy that won't stick up for him. Um, and just if you look at some of the names like like uh, Emerson Clark and John Bowen and, and – uh, you know, and Pat Seeloff and, and myself included, and there's some there's some tough hockey players and some tough dudes in that room that that uh, aren't afraid to to get their noses dirty, and and um, I just 
there isn't another team that would compete with us in that in that division. You, you were an eighth round pick by the Windsor Spitfires. Did you always know that you were gonna play junior hockey growing up? Um, yeah, ever since I was a little boy, um, it's been a dream for me. Uh, growing up, I, I uh, being so close to London, uh, I was actually a London Knights fan growing up, and uh, it's kind of funny how now I can't stand them, but. Uh, no, um, for sure. I, I've always wanted to play junior hockey. I've always wanted to play in the NHL. I've always told my dad that. And um, uh, once I got drafted, I knew it was an opportunity that Windsor thought that there was a potential for me to play and that I was, you know, a good enough hockey player. And, and um, it was a huge step for me in my career, and, and I'm hoping to keep it going. But uh, playing junior hockey in the OHL is definitely a dream come true. It's, uh, it's no secret the Spits are struggling a little bit right now. Uh, what do you think is going wrong? Um, you know, it's, it's a real character test for us right now, and, and it is difficult. And um, it's, it's hard when one of the things that you love so much is depressing you the most. Um, uh, we're, every team goes through a slump, and uh, right now we're in ours, and uh, we're going to get out of it. But a big thing right now is, is um, just to get our passion of the game back and, and the uh, consistency and the intensity in our game back. And, and it's something we're lacking right now. And, and um, everybody in that, in that dressing room needs to, uh, and myself included, need to you know, pull up our socks and, and uh, get back to playing good Windsor Spitfire hockey. Obviously, you, you've lost a couple of teammates in uh, Derek Showmakers, Brandon Devlin, but you got a couple of guys back like Trevor Murphy. Uh, what's it mean, like what's that deal mean to the team? Well, it's it's always tough to lose a guy for sure. I mean, uh, I know I was uh, introduced to it last year. Uh, the first trade we made was Dunnick, and uh, there's actually some tears shed after that. I, you know, I'm not used to you get to love a guy and then all of a sudden he's gone. Um, for sure, that's tough. But uh, now that I've been through the league a year and and I understand what it's about and it's a business and and I understand what it's like to lose a guy. And but uh, definitely getting Murph getting on Murphy and he's a really good room character guy. He's a lot of fun. Um, and I, I've known him from the summer, from being here in the summer. Uh, uh, they're both great players, him and him and um, Zach Lorenz. Yeah, and Laurie, sorry. Um, him, him and Laurie, but they're both awesome hockey players and, and great guys in the room, and, and um, we're just happy to have them. All right, well, this has been another edition of MediaPlex Sports Talk. I'm Kenton Wolf with Ty Bilkey. Since their introduction in 1933, comic books have been a staple in entertainment around the world. But Windsor hasn't seen a comic book event to bring fans together in about 20 years. Here's Adam Albaba. Not since the early 90s has Windsor had a comic book convention. One man wanted to change that. On December 2nd, over 1,400 attended a Merry Comic Book Christmas Con held at the Royal Canadian Legion Metropolitan Branch Number 594. Organized and promoted by Michael Mikulski, the event featured all types of comic books, movies, collectibles, games, and classic toys. With over 20 years of experience in marketing and journalism, Mikulski took it on himself to organize and promote the event. For me, it was comic books that resonated with me as a youth. Uh, and it introduces you to a whole world uh, beyond what you're used to. Uh, thoughts, ideas, concept, political situations, uh, I owe it all to comic books. Partnered with St. Clair College's graphic design and animation programs, the event showcased many local artists and comic book stores. People were encouraged to dress as their favorite superhero through a costume contest hosted by AM800 and CTV's Arms Boom and Leg. This was a first experience for St. Clair College's Vice President of College and Community Relations, John Fairley. One attraction was an R2-D2 replica, along with Legacy Comics' Tony Gray, artist of The Incredible Conduit. This place is just packed. Uh, the the lineups uh, were, were huge, and I haven't stopped all day. This is one of the better conventions that I think I've, I've ever been to. For MediaPlex News Now, I'm Adam Obaba. Thanks for tuning in. Today's fashions have been provided by Couture by Jenna. I'm Majeka Garzalnik, and you've been watching MediaPlex News Now.